Greetings, and welcome back to Stellaris. This will be my Commonwealth of Man playthrough. I don't understand why it is every time I sit down to start recording, I either suddenly get the hiccups or sneezing fits. I can have conversations with people all day long, chat with my friends on TeamSpeak, no problem. The minute I start actually recording, all of a sudden I, I, I'm constantly being interrupted by hiccups or sneezing fits. But enough about me, you're here for Stellaris. So the Commonwealth of Man is a lost colony. This civilization originated as a lost and forgotten colony, separated from its homeworld long ago. The struggling colonists endured many hardships before they were able to build up the necessary technological and industrial base that would allow for a return to space. Now, unlike Prosperous Unification, you don't get a lot of benefits. Prosperous Unification gave you extra population, extra districts already built, and a 20-year buff on your planet. Now, you do get one benefit from Lost Colony, and that is a buff on your homeworld that does not expire. Just your capital gets that buff, though. And you will see it when we get into the game. But the actual effect of being a Lost Colony is it spawns an advanced empire of your species somewhere else in the galaxy. So that means that there will be a Earth Empire in this game. It will either be the United Nations of Earth or the Earth Custodianship. It can randomly be either of the ones. Or if you create and design a Earth Empire, it can use that. The UN-sponsored Ulysses Initiative oversaw the construction of six great arc ships in low Earth orbit at the end of the 21st century. The ships, carrying a quarter of a million colonists each, were sent through a recently discovered subspace phenomenon on the outer edge of the Oort Cloud, a small, unstable wormhole. None were heard from again, and the destabilized wormhole vanished. Yet unbeknownst to Earth, one of the Ark ships survived the passage and established a flourishing colony on a lush alien moon. The pioneers who tamed this world were determined to realize humanity's manifest destiny, dominion over the galaxy at any cost. So the world we colonized is called Unity, and we are led by Sidney Beauclair. We are a military dictatorship. This government is a militaristic form of autocracy, with the ruler serving as the undisputed head of the military, which is firmly in control of the state apparatus. The dictatorial government type does hold elections upon the ruler death to select a new ruler, but you only have to worry about it when your ruler actually dies. Dictatorial governments are ruled by a single individual for life that wields absolute control over the state. Now the modifier for being dictatorial, as the modifier for democracy was an increased chance of automatic resettlement. The, empire, uh, the modifier for dictatorial is a 10% reduction in an empire size effect. Now empire size effect is what happens when you exceed 100 in empire size. It has an increase to the cost of traditions and to research. Now it is twice as penalizing against traditions as it is research. But this will just reduce that effect by 10%. So if you stay under 100 empire size, being a dictatorial government type doesn't really give you any advantage that I'm aware of. There is another thing where your empire size is factored, and that is the cost of edicts. Because edict cost scales up as your empire size gets bigger. But I believe that's just the formula for calculating edicts and is not considered an empire size effect. I could be wrong on that, but I do not believe the dictatorial government type reduces the cost of edicts. It would take a lot of parsing to see, compare different forms of government and edict costs. Or actually, one way to do it is to switch your government type in a game. Check your edict cost before, switch either to dictatorial or away from it and see what the edict cost has changed to. But I have not done that particular um, data mining at this time. Our two civics, our nationalistic zeal, 
A strong sense of nationalistic pride permeates all layers of this society. This reduces our claim influence cost and our war exhaustion gain. So right there, it is encouraging conquest as a means of expansion because you can stay in wars longer and you can claim territory cheaper. We also have distinguished admiralty. The fleet and the admiralty have unusually prominent roles in this society, wielding a great deal of influence in political circles. They have the pick of the litter when it comes to new military recruits. Our admirals and generals start at level 3 instead of level 1. Our admiral level cap is increased by 1, so right at the start of the game they can get level 6. Our fleet command limit is 10 higher at the start of the game, so instead of being capped at 20 ships in a fleet, we're, we can have 30. And our ships have an increased fire rate. So this right here, being a dictatorial system with nationalistic zeal and distinguished admiralty, basically implies that your best means of accomplishing victory with this empire is conquest. However, you have to be very careful early in games. You do not want to get into a evenly matched battle early in the game where you will suffer equivalent losses to your opponent because you will not have the economy to recover from those losses very fast. And that is the quickest way to get all the other empires to dogpile you is if you are a kind of a belligerent empire and your military fleet strength drops after one uh, battle war with another empire, other empires will suddenly see you as weak and they will dogpile you. For those who uh, saw my common uh, United Nations of Earth playthrough, that is what happened to the Prime Awareness. Very few empires liked the Prime Awareness when I actually entered the war against them and started massively ca inflicting casualties on them other empires joined the war and soon enough the prime awareness was completely and utterly destroyed I have had that happen so many times when I have played aggressive empires in the early game you still have to focus on economy the only fights you want to pick are fights where you are guaranteed to win you have to f uh, fight against weaker opponents that is invading pre FTL civilizations or preying on very small empires that are very far behind you or have already suffered huge casualties in another war. You have to be more of a opportunist until you have the economy to recover from losses quickly. Then you can start taking on more challenging battles. Now our ethics are xenophobe, the stakes could not be higher as we reach into the vast, uncharted expansions of the galaxy, for we are gambling with the very survival of our species. Never trust the alien. Its false smile hides an unknowable mind. This gives us a reduction to the influence cost to build star bases. By default, it's 75 influence and 100 alloys for a star base. So right off the bat, we're knocking 15 off of that so we can build star bases for 60. It also boosts our pop growth speed. It gives us the ability to enslave aliens, to purge aliens. We cannot give aliens full military service or full citizenship. We cannot use refugees welcome. And we have decreased opinion for other species. Our other ethic is fanatic militarist. The ability to project force is of paramount importance. The only way to preserve our way of life is to make sure everyone shares it, willingly or not. This further reduces claim influence cost, which stacks with nationalistic zeal. So we can claim uh, other systems from, uh, systems from other empires very cheaply. We also have a further bonus to our fire rate, and we can use the no retreat war doctrine. And we have the same exact humans you would have with the United Nations of Earth. We are adaptive. Species is highly adaptive when it comes to foreign environments. We are nomadic. 
The species has a nomadic past, and its members often think nothing of relocating to another world. Now, since we are not egalitarian, we can use the forced resettlement, so we will get the effect of the 25% reduction in resettlement cost. It is much cheaper for us to shift humans from one colony to another, because we are nomadic. And we are still wasteful, which gives us an increase to pop consumer goods upkeep. Members of this species seemingly have no concept of frugality and are prone to useless consumption. Now, my play style generally, when I play Commonwealth of Man, is I am looking to be the Galactic Emperor. I am looking to be the overlord of every other empire in the galaxy. They are either going to be my subject or they are going to be absorbed. There is no middle ground. We are not making truces. There are no equals. Humans are the superior species. We know how to manage an empire far better than they do, so they had best serve us. They're really good for taking care of the jobs that humans don't really like doing. Now, the problem with this particular concept is, well, like most, the story, as the story of the game unfolds, things are prone to shifting. And being a xenophobe is very hard to hang on to as the game progresses. Just like any form of bigotry, it is based on ignorance. The more you understand another culture or species, the less there is to fear from them, and the more you begin to like them. So when we have dealings with other empires, the more we begin to understand them and see how some of them are not very different than us, it is very difficult to hang on to xenophobe, unless you use willful, willful ignorance to reinforce it by basically trying to make people ignore the similarities and focus on the differences. So it is entirely possible, and it has happened in multiple of my Commonwealth of Man playthroughs, that we shift away from being xenophobes. That does not change my desire to be the Galactic Emperor. That just changes how I view my subjects. I will start viewing them less like tools and maybe be a little bit more benevolent. It's not that they are inferior to us anymore, it's just I am the better choice for leader because I know the best direction for the galaxy, but I don't see you as lesser beings anymore necessarily, just you're not the right being for the job. Now I am going to edit one thing with Commonwealth of Man because I do like using the mammalian ships. I think that has a very Terran Empire look, much better than the humanoid ships which seem more Federation. Now they do have an Imperial ship set, but that ship set is what you get switched to if you are the Galactic Custodian or the Galactic Emperor, so I will be switching to that when it happens. For now, I would much prefer to stick with Mammalian. Now, I do not, this is not going to be the exact opposite of my United Nations of Earth playthrough. I still focus on economy, because as I said, especially early game, you have to build your economy to be able to take on equal challenges. And I do use diplomacy. I am not a fanatic purifier, or a determined exterminator, or a devouring swarm. I'm not seeking to wipe out all the other aliens. They have uses. They have value as subjects and slaves. But diplomacy is a tool. It is what will keep an empire that is currently stronger than me from jumping down my throat while I'm doing something else. It is also what will keep multiple enemies at bay while I focus on one and pick them off one at a time. My approach to di diplomacy in this is less like the Terran Empire from Star Trek Mirror Universe, which is mainly threats and intimidation, and more like some of the other examples in Star Trek, or better example would be Palpatine in Star Wars. Diplomacy is a tool to keep your people off guard until you get to a position of strength. Then it is threats and intimidation. But I kind of 
the example I really kind of like is the Romulans from Star Trek. The Romulans were very deceitful and very closed with diplomacy. But if you watched the entirety of Star Trek and saw the evolution of the Romulan Empire to where, especially toward the end of like Next Generation and some of the later movies, they actually started to understand and respect uh, the United Nations, I mean the Federation a little bit more, especially Picard and some of the other captains, because they realized they weren't very different. And that is kind of how you see xenophobe shift away from an empire. Now I have changed some of my settings. I did drop the AI empires down a little bit. I believe it was 11 to 22 is what I originally had. I just dropped it down a few notches. So there are slightly less AI empires. Other than that, I am upping tech and tradition cost to double. Now that is mainly going to have an impact on the early game and make it take five to 10 years for your first few techs. Once your techs start kicking in and your, you gain multiple colonies and your research starts to build, it will still go fairly quickly once you get to around mid game or begin to approach mid game. Another change I'm going to make is to increase the crisis strength to 2.5. I am also shifting it because this option was not available in my last playthrough to where you can, we will have all crises. If we get to that point, all three of them or four or five, whatever is available in the game will pop up. I am also slightly adjusting the game years. Mid game start year instead of being 2400 will be 2350 just 50 years earlier but it should work so in game start year will actually be 2500 instead of 2600 a good hundred years earlier and i'm going to have the victory year since i still haven't gotten the achievement for a victory just a hundred years after in game starts i am increasing the difficulty to grand admiral and using scaling difficulty to have them have the Grand Admiral bonuses by mid-game. So by the year 2350, the AI will be getting their Grand Admiral bonuses. This also, I am using difficulty adjusted AI modifiers. What this basically means is at Grand Admiral, they will get double bonus from techs. So like if I get a tech that says plus 20% mining bonus, the AI will get plus 40% out of it. The other thing I have adjusted is previously I had guaranteed habitable world set to zero. They have done a lot of adjustment to some of the origins to make the guaranteed habitable worlds have meaning on more of them. So I am re-increasing it to two. And I will be reactivating Iron Man mode. Now this playthrough actually jumped two or three patches from my last one. So we also have the combat rework. Toxoids were not in my previous game at the very start. More than a century has passed since the great arc ship Chrysanthemum carried a quarter of a million of our ancestors from distant Earth to the garden world we have come to know as Unity. After a long and perilous journey, the colonists rejoiced when they first saw sunlight again, albeit from a foreign star. The early years were difficult. Citizen militias were formed to fight off the lethal alien wildlife that we found ourselves sharing our new home with, and cultivating the terrestrial crops that had been brought proved harder than imagined. Yet for each challenge overcome, we become stronger. Once this world had been tamed, our numbers grew exponentially. The last few decades have seen great leaps in technology, and we are now, finally, ready to reach out and reclaim the stars from whence we came. Now much like my other playthroughs, there are several things I like to do before I actually start the game. The first thing I would like to do is check out Sydney Beauclair. She has Warlike. Bonus to ship weapon damage and army damage. This leader does not shy away from conflict. And expansionist. A reduction in both 
starbase influence cost and the outpost build cost. So both the alloy and the influence cost of starbases are reduced. This leader aims to expand their borders. That is a very good one for a starting leader. We got lucky on that because these traits are random. Now one thing you will notice is instead of having a situation log like I did in the democracy, we have an agenda. This agenda will give bonuses for as long as she is the leader of this empire, Grand Marshal. Fleet expansion, ship build cost, ship upkeep are both reduced, ship build speed is faster. This is a really good start because I can start building up my fleet early on a lot cheaper because usually alloys are a pretty bad struggle early in the game. I can expand quickly and I get bonuses in both invasions and fleet combat. Now the next thing I like to change are my policies. So we are going to start with expansionists. That's another 10% reduction to the outpost build cost, which is the alloy cost. We will be keeping unrestricted wars, oppressive vassalage, indiscriminate bombardment, allowed resettlement, aggressive first contact protocol. Now this is one thing. I kind of used to like cautious quite a bit, more of a neutral stance than wanting to be aggressive right off the bat, making it harder for them to target us and less likely we'll get negative first contact. Because I'm not looking to make everybody an enemy, but I would like to be the one to initiate the first contact and I would like to have less negative events so we can start off kind of friendly until I see how weak they are and if I can jump on them. But in order to invade pre-FTL civilizations, you cannot be uncautious. You have to be on aggressive. So we have to keep it on aggressive just in case we find a pre-FTL civilization on a world we can inhabit so we can quickly conquer them and get another colony quickly. I don't care if they are in the Stone Ages. They can still do slave labor. And it's still a world my humans can move to. Now, first contact added a lot of benefits for setting up observation post, which is something I almost never used as Commonwealth of Men before. But they will now have value on worlds that I cannot colonize. So if I run into like desert or arid worlds or Arctic worlds that humans aren't any good at, I now have a reason to actually build an observation post and see what these miserable excuses for beings are doing. We will start with closed borders, and none of these others will be changed. Robotic workers have a lot of value to me early on. However, unlike the United Nations of Earth, I do not think I will ever advance to droids because I do not want to deal with them jumping up and doing jobs they're not designed for. Robots are tools for the most part starting out for the United Nations I mean, for the Commonwealth of Man. We just want to get up to where we have robots and we have them with the first upgrade so we can design mining robots and farming robots and technician robots and get them to do the menial tasks that the humans do not want to do. And we're keeping all of these others on slavery, purging, and population controls. The next thing I want to do is redesign the ships. Turning off auto-generated designs, we have the North Star. It is an interceptor. Now that's not a bad design for an interceptor. Heavy on the shields, using all of its power. That's actually a pretty good ship. It has one missile and two mass drivers. Because the missile will ignore shields and these will tear down the shields while the missiles are working on the armor. So this will be my North Star Interceptor. We'll deactivate Auto Upgrade. And we are going to design one more ship type. There are only now two choices for Corvettes. We want a Picket type. So we are going to give them a Sentinel Point Defense to shoot down other missiles. Now they made a more significant change between the types of Point Defense. Sentinel Point Defense 
does reduce damage to shields but it has armor penetration and does double damage to armor. So it doesn't have to go through all of the armor and it uh, in tears down the armor faster because missiles are armored. And fighters have shields. So the flak battery now has shield penetration and shield damage, a bonus shield damage and reduction to armor damage. Be uh, because missiles don't have shields they have armor so the flak battery is even more designed to be anti strike craft and the sentinel point defense is even more designed to be anti-missile so we're gonna put one sentinel point defense on here and two missile launchers we're not even gonna worry about tearing down things shields we are just going to be hitting them with missiles, and the whole reason for the Sentinel Point Defense is if my enemies use missiles or strike craft. Well, mainly missiles. However, there has been a change since they did the missile change. Lone Outposts no longer have a missile launcher. What they get instead is usually a kinetic battery. So... I don't have to worry about the missiles when I go to take outposts. As a matter of fact, you can't even put missiles on star bases anymore. They've repa replaced the missile module with a torpedo module instead. So star bases will get medium-sized guns, torpedoes, or hangar bays. They no longer have access to missiles. You want any missiles defending your outpost and star base? You need defense platforms. And just like the other design, we'll go with one armor and two deflectors. And this will be the Cockatrice Picket. Now the real difference between these two will be when I get combat computers. Now we need to design some defense platforms, even though because of their price, it will be a while before I get access to them. The first thing we want to do is start with a light. And one, since I'm pretty much going to mix shields and armor, what I'm going to do is switch one t side at a time so I can go down here and say like deflectors on this section, switch this one to light, and fill all the rest with armor. So it's three shields, three armor. It doesn't matter which side these are on. They still affect the entire uh, vessel. Now with this light section, all missiles. So we have a pertinacity missile class defense platform. And we will leave auto upgrade on missile uh, on platforms because there is no fleet manager for platforms. It won't screw anything up. Now for our next one, we're going to make a point defense. And again, I'm going to be switching one at a time so I can keep these filled out quicker. Now, I could have put all flak batteries on one side and all sentinel, but I'm a little bit specific when it comes to where I want them. I kind of want the flak batteries... Well, actually, I just put them in the wrong spot. I kind of want the flak batteries on the outside. So they'll be the first two slots. And then I'll fill the rest with Sentinel Point Defense in the back that go after the missiles. And this will be the Paramount Point Defense. Or actually, we'll just abbreviate that as PD. Because it seems weird to say... Point defense class defense platform. So Paramount PD class defense platform. And then for our next one, we are going to design a medium. And for this medium, we're mainly going to be dealing... You don't want short-range weapons generally on a star base or supporting a star base. Because as the game progresses, what's mainly going to be going after your star bases are going to be battleships, titans, things that have really long-range weapons. So what I'm going to use with the mediums, 
is my longest range weapon, which goes out to 75. It is my medium mass drivers. Now, early in the game, it's mainly going to be corvettes and destroyers and frigates that will be coming after my star bases. So I don't really need a whole lot of range, but I'd like to get as close to 100 as possible because if they do have missiles, they have a range of 100. But this one is going to be mass drivers. You just gave me the Paramount name again. Discipline. And this will be an MK class, medium kinetic. Now we will design a heavy section. Now as much as I like really big kinetic batteries, the large kinetic weapons have a minimum range of 45. Well, this early in the game, I'm going to be dealing with corvettes and destroyers, which are going to come up close anyway. The red lasers have no minimum range. They'll shoot out just as far as the medium mass drivers to about a range of 80. So we are going to fill these with lasers. And this will be the Integrity LE, Large Energy. And one last station design, the hangar sections. And currently we only have access to scout wings. The exemplary hangar. Now, I like to name these things so I can quickly see what they are so I know what I'm building. But naming them like I do in a multiplayer game is a bad idea because if your opponent takes the time just to look at this stuff, he knows what he wants to target first or what you've got just off of the names if he can figure out the code that you particularly use. So there we have our designs. Now we will go to our technology tab. Now we have Yaroslav Romanov as our physics researcher. He is a spark of genius, prone to sudden bursts of inspiration, no particular specialty, Right now, a 20% boost to our researchers. Now, previously, I said that's not going to be a huge amount. But wait until you see that something. Okay, so we are generating 20 physics research. 10 of that, closer to 11, comes from jobs. So this will be two extra research. This will be about a 10% increase in my overall physics research. Now, that's not a huge amount in a standard game. In a slow research game, it makes a huge difference, as you will see. So this is the one we're going to go for first, is quantum theory. Because as you see, the first tech is going to take me 170 months. That's 15 years, or, close, or just under 15 years. However, that's with one research building. The minute I build a second research building, this will drop in half. The minute I get some stored research, this will drop in half. So it's not going to take me 15 years to get my first research. It'll take me between 5 and 8, depending on how lucky I get on anomalies, how quickly I can get another research facility up, and how many research nodes I get through stations. So. Just like in most games, your initial uh, time for how long it's going to take you to research is not going to stay that way the entire time. Don't get too intimidated seeing it's going to take me 15 years to get this. It isn't going to be 15 years. We will have this in 5 to 10. But as you see, that drastically slows down the early game pace. And I love that. Now for society, we have Mitsu Yamaguchi. He is a statecraft expert. Leader is, following years of study, considered an expert within the field of statecraft. And planetary unification is a statecraft. That is the first one we will be getting for the lump sum of unity and the additional monthly unity. Now that lump sum of unity is based upon my unity output. It's not huge, but right now the costs for traditions are low. So that should still be enough to get me a tradition quickly. Well, I say quickly, but then again, it's going to take a good five years to get this tech. And 
in that time my unity output should increase but also my tradition cost is going to increase so it will only take him 164 months but like I said that's going to drop drastically for engineering we have Azizi Nikwali this leader is quick to adopt new methods and ideas if they prove superior he's adaptable faster experience gain All right, while I said nanomechanics is a good one for the bonus research, since we are going for a militarized, I want to get standardized Corvette patterns as quick as possible just for the reduction in build cost and how quickly we turn them out. Because that means we can reinforce our fleets, especially after they suffer damage faster. We need this one as soon as possible. 205 months, but again, it's not going to take that long. Now, if we look at society management, you saw the drastic time increase for research. It's not really that drastic for traditions. I'll have my first tradition in two years, provided my unity does not increase. What is increased is how much traditions increase beyond uh, as they go up. Your first few traditions still fairly, fairly cheap, but the prices will scale higher. Now, other than that, we have unity. Unlike United Nations of Earth, the features on this world are not unique. They are the same ones you will find on every planet. The black soils, the fertile lands, rugged woods, rich mountains, prosperous mazes, all of these you'll find on every planet. And we start with the three generic blockers that most every empire will get. Just three generic type of blockers an industrial wasteland a forgotten civilization and a sprawling slum and all of these do not require tech and as a matter of fact the sprawling slum that every empire gets on their home world will give you one free pop but we need 300 energy credits to get it other than that we can't really build anything now one thing that's always annoyed me is you start with commercial zones that's kind of a waste of a building to me. I will be getting clerks through city districts. I don't really want to waste a building slot on clerks. If I want amenities, I will get a hollow theater. The one advantage of clerks is they do not have an upkeep cost beyond what your citizens require. So that is what is allowing me to get a little bit of amenities right off the start. Surplus. If I, when I switch this to hollow theaters, it's going to drain my consumer goods. Now, this is the colonial spirit buff. Determined to forge a new life on the frontier, the forefathers of this colony had an astounding work ethic, which became a time-honored tradition. 10% happiness, 15% amenities, 15% resources from jobs, 10% habitability bonus. This never expires. We will have this bonus for the rest of the game and that 15% resources from jobs with the Empire Capital bonus, another 10% means you get 25% bonus resources from jobs on your capital. And that does affect administrators and research. So a lost colony, you have a lot of encouragement to add extra research labs because these research labs will be getting 25% more resources. And that's just Empire Capital and Colonial Spirit. Doesn't take into account your stability and your governor bonuses. And as you start getting Ascension tiers, the capital bonus can increase and add another 250% bonus to the 10% which means it'll add another 25% where you're effectively getting a 50% boost to resources from jobs. So that means this makes a very good research world because you can get a bonus to your researchers. It also still makes a fairly good administrative world if you'd rather plow through the unity. But in a slow research game, definitely makes a good research world because another basically doubling my well actually it'd be a 33 percent increase because i'm getting 
a flat amount Empire Base, about the same amount from researchers, this will just end up being like a 50% increase to my output, but that will still have a tremendous impact on how long it gets to get technologies. Now that's one thing. Little bonuses make a huge difference in a slow research game. That means that the bonuses that the AI have make a huge difference. So they will be able to pull ahead of me in technology. I will have a nice, difficult time trying to stay bleeding edge. Now, one thing I should mention is advanced start AIs, which is what the parent colony of me will be. Do not start with extra technology. All an advanced start empire, AI empire starts with is both of their habitable worlds developed into colonies. So they start with three established colonies instead of one, which means more population, which means more buildings, which means more resource output. They also start with more stockpiles than just a hundred in most of these. They get about 10 times this value. So they'll have about a thousand to 2000 in each of these. So they get a little bit of a head start in resources and in population and in established buildings. Now that does translate that they will get their tech before I do because they will have more than one research facility right off the bat and the economy to support it. But they don't start with any techs. At the very start of the game, if I find an advanced start AI empire, it does not have any tech advantage over me. It has advantage in the rest of the empire. So if I get lucky and find an advanced start empire that is at war with someone else, I can jump on them and take them out because they don't have a technological advantage. They had a numerical advantage. And if another empire is dealing with that numerical advantage, they're prime candidates for plundering. Now, since I want another research facility pretty quickly, I'm not going to bother adding extra mining stations just yet. I want to bank my minerals so I can start building another research facility soon. I also want to get the extra population from clearing that blocker. So I am going to sell 100 food. And I need to go to my strike force. Go to my fleet manager and refit these designs. And I'm going to use the interceptor for now. No, I think I may actually use the picket because it is cheaper. They're only 88 for me to turn out as opposed to 90. The Interceptor has a little bit more firepower. Let's see, it's 163 versus... No, the Picket actually has more firepower. While the Picket point defense option is not going to have much use unless I run into somebody else using missiles, having the two missiles actually gives me engagement at a range of 100 and a higher damage output than the two mass drivers and one missile. So I can engage from a larger range. I, I will start the fight shooting first, basically. And it's only going to cost me about 20 alloys to upgrade these ships. We'll start them upgrading because it's going to take me five months before I get the Unity to hire another scientist. I still want a second scientist. Actually, I may end up with three because I like to send scientists in different directions until I encounter people. But at the same time, I'd like to keep one nearby looking for my guaranteed habitable worlds. There's one of them. It's not the best size, a 13, but that's the first system we're going to survey so that we can get a habitable world going in a second colony, which means after I get another science ship, my next investment with alloys is going to be a colony ship, but I got to kind of wait. I can spend my alloys until I get 200 consumer goods and 200 food. What anomalies we encounter, what events we encounter, what precursor we have, all of those will shape how I play as I go along. Now the hunt for the hyacinth is pretty much a guaranteed when if you play Commonwealth of Man, it's the story mode for Lost Colony. 
We have found no traces of the four ARC ships that passed through the wormhole before the Chrysanthemum arrived at Unity. One ship, the Hyacinth, was scheduled to make the passage after us, and the Chrysanthemum's long-range sensors reported a brief energy spike from the wormhole shortly before it destabilized and vanished. Assuming the Hyacinth survived the passage and made it to our galactic neighborhood, the ARC ship has so far failed to establish contact with us. It might be a good idea to search nearby systems for signs of its presence. Make it so. Indeed, make it so. New sit rep. Now that gives us three systems to search. Now, it's not just go into the system. We have to do full surveys of these three systems to get credit. So I do need to survey those systems. Now, one thing about Guaranteed Habitable Worlds, I do not believe my Guaranteed Habitable Worlds will end up with a pre-FDL civilization on them. They might get pre-sapients, but I believe it, they're blocked from having an actual pre-FTL so that I can colonize them. But honestly, it'd be easier if they had a pre-FTL, because instead of building a colony ship for 200 food, 200 consumer goods, 200 alloys, I could build armies for minerals and just invade. Ships refitted. Okay, so that system doesn't connect this way. It looks like we're in a little niche in this spiral arm that the connection passes below us over here. So it looks like there would be, probably be a good choke point system up this way that I'm going, the direction I'm going. I'm not sure where this extends. We'll have to check that out. Now, I have 90 alloys. That should be enough to start on a ship. Another science ship. Yeah, because I have the reduction in cost. It would take two months for it to turn out. I will not have the unity in that time, but I can go ahead and start it headed to a system to start pushing on. So we will go ahead and turn out another science ship. Another thing I probably should have done is up how many of these pickets I want. I think we're going to do go to 12 pickets and then we'll probably add about 8 interceptors to this fleet. That way we have a little bit more firepower or at least close range guns to shoot small ships as opposed to just missiles. Though a full fleet of 20 pickets would not be too bad, it's just they have a weapon that is useless unless my opponents have missiles. Now I have the energy credits now to go ahead and start removing this sprawling slum. And I did forget to check my governor out. Cal Sima, or Kai Sima. He has agrarian upbringing. The leader was raised in a rural farming area and has several ideas on how agrarian yields may be improved. Not the best one since far, uh, farming is not my priority early in the game. Now this will give me an extra population. After that I really need to invest in minerals. The clerk jobs are providing a little bit of amenities, but what I really need is more mineral production followed by more consumer goods and alloys. So I need a few more mining districts and then industrial districts so that I can support things like entertainers and such and the clerk jobs can pretty much stay vacant so I have five people I could upgrade to specialist eventually. Alright we got our second science ship It's going to take at least two months to get another leader. How long will it take me to get here? Three months. And to get another leader, cost 100. So in three months, I should be able to put a leader in here. And then, so about, about July, I should be able to hire a leader and be able to send them to survey this system 
so that I can start my quest for the Hyacinth. Uh, we've already met somebody. The Queptilium Archivist. Yes, yes, we've heard it all before. We are the Queptilium Archivist, and you are the Commonwealth of Man. Greetings, well met, stay out of our space, or face certain doom, and so forth. Now, if you'll excuse us, we're quite busy. Um, do not interfere with our endeavors, alien. The news that we have encountered intelligent alien life for the first time has shaken our society to the core. Leaked footage of these bizarre creatures is spreading throughout media outlets, outlets across the Commonwealth of Man, and many citizens have been gripped by panic. Rioting has been reported in several cities on Unity. The strange Xenos have achieved a level of technology far beyond our own and they appear to have been spacefaring for thousands of years, possibly even longer. Fortunately for us, their kind appear to be a decrepit and stagnating species. Their age is over. The time of the human has come. Alright, so they are obviously going to be a good choke point that direction. <laughs> Can we get to this space without going through theirs? That's the big question. Now, hiring this, hiring this leader is going to be about a six-month setback on me getting this, so it'll still take another two and a half years or so from here to gain our first tradition. But a second scientist has a lot of value to me. So we have... A materials expert, a mindful scientist, and a computing expert. Now let's currently check and see what we are researching. Computing. That would allow us to move Yaroslav down to engineering and cut some time off of that. So that's actually who we're going to hire. Right now it's at 165 months. If we recruit, recruit Yulo or Yulo, we have dropped it down seven months. That's half a year. Now, if we it's 199 for engineering. If we replace, if we put Yaroslav here, we've knocked 17 months off of that. We've knocked a year and a half off of getting this and now we can take this ship and put the person who has the increased experience gain because the ones who earn experience the fastest are actually your ones out doing surveys which also reminds me I did not check our other scientist Cassandra Popovic she is meticulous the leader is thorough in their examinations of the unknown phenomenon so she gains a 10% chance to find anomalies and anomalies are what are going to help fuel our early research. So we will have the emissary go survey this system while the traveler is surveying that one. And the developer is doing nothing. Now we have only a few more orders left. I'm going to go ahead and start sending the developer this way. It's going to take about three months for him to get there. In that time, I should have be able to queue up claiming that system. And then my next thing is to wait till I get the alloys to start building a construct uh, colony ship. Which does remind me, we are going to be getting a good supply of energy credits. Early in the game, you want to be buying things. Now, I could set up the automatic trades. But really, if you do an automatic trade for more than like eight a month, it's going to slowly push the price up. You're kind of better off setting up this uh, just buying every three months, buying the lowest one, if you want to keep the price down by the next time you buy. But we can either invest in minerals to get our world developing faster, or alloys to start being able to get a fleet and get colony ships. So this 
first purchase is going to be alloys. That will also give us enough that I can actually, as soon as this is surveyed, go ahead and queue up building the star base there. But yeah, now that I have started clearing that blocker, I can spend every three months either buying minerals or buying alloys to push along my development faster. When I have enough alloys, I could buy consumer goods. The first league is our precursor in this one. We've recovered artifacts from an ancient alien civilization on Tenab Prime. If what we have learned from these artifacts is correct, this civilization was some sort of confederation that consisted of many different alien races. They called themselves the First League and appear to have coexisted in relative peace some two million years ago. Though the Tanab system lies in the region of space that seems to have made up the core of their territory, a partial map found among the artifacts indicates that this First League may have covered a significant portion of our galaxy before its eventual collapse. New sit rep. If we can find enough relics from their civilization, it may be possible to pinpoint the location of their home system. It's going to take six artifacts. Just like the Cybrex in our previous game. Now we finally surveyed Tenab. No great features. It is a good mining world. That is great. Now, it isn't a very big world, but this will make a great mining world. And there's no blockers blocking the mining world. There are some impassable mountains blocking our overall districts. But we can still manage to get all eight of the mining districts, and then probably about three city districts just to add more building slots. Right now, that's not too bad for a world so that we have a surplus of minerals to help us develop other colonies and support alloy and consumer good production back on Deneb. Field engineers have cleared a blocker. All right, so Unity now has its full allotment of people. It's going to be two years before it needs more, but I can build early because the clerk jobs, they're usually better working on something else. Now, I will still need a few to make amenities until I build a hollow theater but before I build a hollow theater I need more consumer good production before I get more consumer good production I need more minerals so the first thing I do want to build here is a mining district and I should be able to queue one up in October and there's our other guaranteed habitable world I believe Hantaron 3 Actually, he's going to get in position before I finish the survey, I believe. Recon pass completed. All right, so now that I'm done with this survey, I need to push this way, and I'm not going to survey every system along the way. First, I got to see how I get over there. So we're just going to explore this direction. And go ahead and queue up our first outpost. 48 influence, 75 alloys. I'm going to be expanding pretty quickly without the huge bottleneck I usually have in influence and alloys. That's nice. Now, after I finish surveying this system, I do need to be able to connect to where this is so either I'm gonna to have to survey this system as I pass through I will see if it's worth surveying or I'm gonna to have to come back and survey this system with a whole bunch of useless planets in it now in addition to the hunt for the hyacinth there's another potential story arc that can pop up that is randomly chosen between others I can get a fanatic religious sect that tries to rebel I can get uh, the automated probes we sent out. I can get a few other as well. And I really hate getting the religious sect as Commonwealth of Man. They're just annoying in my opinion. 
All right, so the first thing we need to queue up here on Unity is another mining district. That'll pull a couple of clerks over here to be more miners so that we will be able to do further development faster. Now, normally I would like to get my building slots first, but I need another mining district to support another industrial district so that I can actually get hollow theaters to have more amenities and then get another research lab so that it's not going to take me 15 years to get most of this stuff. He's got a long time. There's eight things he's searching here. So let's see, Tybor. These two look about the same. This one would actually be faster to survey. But this one is closer to being a choke point. So after I finish with Hanteron, I am going to survey this one so that I can move down this way and get to my other habitable world. And then after I do that, I think I'm going to push up and just go straight to that system to survey the other one. Ah, good. We can jump this way and then there. So I can go ahead and tell him to go straight for the hunt for the Hyacinth. And I forgot to buy more alloys. I've got eight more months before I will need more minerals. So I will have at least two more chances to purchase minerals. And in those eight months, I will get 200 more anyway. So that'll get me all the way up to 450, which is going to be just a little short because it's going to cost 500 for another industrial district. Just a little short of getting an industrial district, but so be it. Now, another thing I can do is I could spare a worker right now, which does remind me I could be selling. My food is going to be climbing faster than my consumer goods. I can just bolster my energy credits a little bit more early on. Now, unlike the United Nations of Earth, I don't just like slowly survey everything at the start. I'm trying to find some decent choke points to make sure that I can secure territory first and trying to find habitable worlds pretty quickly because I need to take a militaristic bent, which means I need to develop a little bit faster. Construction complete. Until I get a bit more development on Unity, I am not quite so interested in picking up these little bitty star uh, stations yet. So we are just going to send the developer back to Deneb Station so that it is costing us 0.25 less in upkeep. That will add up because I've already, you know, uh, in about a year, that would save me four energy or three energy credits. But still, that, that helps out when your income is low. Speaking of helping out when income is low, I should have done this on day one. Dismantled this trade hub. It takes a long time before I actually pick up some other systems that are going to give trade value. As a matter of fact, I'm not even exp expanding that direction yet, uh, either Gekul or Austin. I plan on getting this system, this system, and probably pushing up to a decent choke point over here first. So there's no point in me paying one energy credit a month in upkeep for something that is going to bring me absolutely no value right now. So we are just going to dismantle that trade mm -hmm. hub so that I can earn an extra energy credit, which will help me buy other resources I need more frequently. And I got that right before we clicked over a month to save myself the extra energy credit. Now we still got five more months before we need another district, and we're going to need 500 minerals for that. So I think I'm going to go ahead and buy 100 more minerals. In five months, I will get another 125. That'll put me at 375. Or now that'll put me about 350. I can buy up, so I'll be a little bit short. It won't be until. Yeah, it will be July before I can start the development. So that means Deneb will be idle for a little bit, but it's something I can deal with. 
Speaking of which, I can sell another hundred food. And I can actually, since I have such a huge surplus of energy credits, also buy some more alloys. And then in the, because I'm going to be buying minerals for a bit, but I do need 200 alloys, 200 consumer goods, and 200 food to build a colony ship. And I'm going to need two colony ships eventually. That gets me a decent supply of alloys. I can buy consumer goods and minerals next time because in three months I'll have another 150. I'll be up to 300. I could buy minerals and consumer goods. And then by July, I will almost have enough food just off of what I'm generating. Now I can go ahead and fire up this edict. I can always cancel it later. It doesn't cost me anything to fire it up. I just have to have that amount banked. So it's not going to cost me 14 unity to fire it. And having this running when I have no other edicts to do is making use of my edict fund. Which means when I actually do decide to upgrade star bases, they will upgrade faster. Instead of taking a year, they'll only take six months. So there's no reason not to have that running. Since I do not plan on going Discovery, so I'm not going to be running Map to Stars. Usually my first one with Commonwealth of Man depends on what I have located. If I have located a pre-FTL, I usually go Domination. If I've located another Empire, I usually go Supremacy. If I have not located either, I usually start with Expansion. Oh my! Tropical, ocean, and desert. Two of those worlds will have decent habitability on. Since we're humans, we have plus 10% to uh, habitability. So that, I think we are going to push this way. That would be a good choke point for this direction. Actually, we may have a decent choke point depending on where it connects up through here because of this empire. But more than likely, there's another connection up this way we're going to have to look for. But this is a very good choke point system for two directions so far. So I think after we survey that system, the Traveler will start surveying back this way so that we would be able to claim to this choke point. Oh, another decent continental world here in this system. Yeah, that's a third potential colony. All right, buy 100 more minerals. Buy 50 consumer goods. And we should be fairly close to getting our first colony ship under construction. Now this is wor is a early mining station worth doing when I get there. But by then I'll be claiming all the mining stations because I will have enough development on Unity. I will be able to spare my minerals for actually... Oh, and it looks like we may have the 500 minerals by the time July runs around. Yeah. So we can start production of an industrial district, which does remind me I should have watched my workers. It would have helped if I had dropped two clerks to be miners. We would have been earning more miner, uh, minerals a month. According to that, we are down to negative amenities. I don't think that's going to have a tremendous impact, that low of a negative, so we should be fine. But yeah, by the time October rolls around, I should be able to start on my first colony ship. Oh, we finally checked out this world. Size 23, decent size. No features. It's got quite a few blockers. It'd be an agrarian world more than anything else, but I can still use it as mining. Early in the game, you don't need a lot of agriculture. It's not until much later in the game when I have a whole bunch of colonies I really need to start worrying about it. I can 
just go mining on a lot of early worlds. But Deneb actually looks like it would make a decent bread basket anyway, eventually. But we do have a decent mining world in Teneb. Or Tenab. Alright, let's actually buy... Huh, I hate to have to do it. But we're going to buy more minerals. And we're actually going to buy 50 more consumer goods. So I can actually get started on our first colony ship. And actually I should do it from the planet. So it'll immediately head toward the planet when it comes out. Flaxington. That's a weird name for a mine, but okay. And we still do have a little bit more alloys. I, I could have done it without buying the consumer goods. I forgot I have a 10% reduction in the cost of building ships. I should have looked here. I actually only needed 180 of each type because of the Grand Marshal's reduction. Yeah, 10% to all of the materials required to build a ship. But we are actually going to fill this other module slot with a shipyard. That way, while it is tied up building colony ships, while I get surplus alloys, I can start filling out my fleet. Now, it is very necessary to get my fleet size up, because that will, not only does that normally help your influence, but that's not going to be a huge deal for me early on. Being militarist, when I get factions, they are very displeased by me not having a naval capacity close to my actual empire size in fleet coverage. And maintaining factions is very important unless you want all of your people to be unhappy, have low stability, and risk revolutions. You got to keep at least your two most prominent factions happy. Now Unity is going to be building for a year so I can take this time to start investing in these mining and research stations. And the first thing we want to do is a mining sta the mining stations. We'll build that one, enter orbit of that one, and build it before we head over here and build that one. And then we will head to Tanab and build that one. And with that that will start giving us a nice little tr uh, additional add-on now that we've got some development going on on Unity that will take a while. And sure, that's 400 minerals I'm spending, but in the long run it will help us out. Recon pass completed. The CNS emissary reports no sign of the hyacinth in the Hanteron system. We should continue our search elsewhere. Now it takes about three months to build a mining station and in three months I should have another hundred minerals so I don't really need to be buying minerals to support this as much I can actually go back to buying alloys completed. so that I can start supplementing my fleet scans for the CNS traveler have revealed no traces of the hyacinth in the Dutari system perhaps we'll have better luck in one of the other systems she has to be out there so we have found a barbarian alien civilization on Dultari 2. They appear to be in the later stages of the Bronze Age, having mastered early metalworking. Although most of the population is rural, several large city-states have formed. We should consider building an observation post above their world to study them more closely. No. This is a habitable world for us. When we get this system, we are going to have troops in place. These guys are relatively weak. One of our, all we need is one troop, and we can take them out most likely. But I'll probably have two troops built. But we get a couple of troops and land here, and we will have a world without having to build a colony ship that we can immediately start developing on. We don't have to wait for it to become a colony. Now, sure these handful of eight population they currently have will have stellar 
uh, shock for a while and be absolutely worthless. But all they're going to be doing is farming or something for us. They're slaves. They're going to be doing menial tasks. Let's see, what are they? Very strong. Bonus to worker research output. Oh, they have decent army strength. They're enduring. Oh, they are decadent. That's bad. They're going to be real unhappy as slaves, but guess what? I don't care. You're still going to be slaves. Let's go to our species tab and set our default rights. These are for our non-humans. Uh, non so their default is slaves. Their living standards will be basic subsistence. That's already going to be a penalty to their happiness. Well, being slaves is going to be a penalty. They can only be soldiers. Yeah, we do want to produce armies of them because these guys are strong. They are allowed to colonize, so I could put them on colony ships. I'm okay with that. We can send slaves out to colonize a new world. They will have population controls enabled, so we can stop them from growing if we want to. Well, wait, wait, wait. That's preventing them from growing entirely while this is on. Same thing for migration controls. This prevents them from moving between colonies. Adding on migration controls means they can't shift to our other colonies and automatically start growing there, which is what I prefer to do with non-humans. You go when I tell you to move. You don't automatically start migrating somewhere else. So we will put migra migration controls on. And slavery type indentured servitude they can be entertainers they can be soldiers but they get they get a 20 percent happiness hit and a bonus to political power now i think i am going to leave that on because when i first conquer a new species they're going to be a little upset there's going to be a lot unemployed these unemployed ones will become servants, I believe. No, that's domestic servitude. Yeah, actually, I think we're going to use chattel slavery because that gives them a bonus to resources from jobs, though it does hit take a, they take a bigger hit to their happiness. Um, they can still be soldiers, but they can't be entertainers and the like. We're going to make them chattel slaves. Chattel slavery is the most common form of slavery in the galaxy. Whether for life or for a limited time, unrestricted access to the labor of others in some parts seen as a privilege with numerous counter duties attached and elsewhere considered a self-evident prerequisite for a functioning society. So yes, they are going to be slaves. Uh, that we normally use for workers. Now, if we find a decent species that might make good servants, or we would want to work as entertainers. These guys can't be soldiers, though. Indentured servants cannot be soldiers. They can only be... Wor they, they can be specialists, but we don't care about them being specialists. Humans are the specialists. So we want these guys to be chattel slaves. Because we do want them to be soldiers. We want to make armies out of them. They are strong. And sure, they're going to be even more unhappy as slaves. I don't care. If they get out of line, we'll destroy them. Alright, we still got about a year, ten months, before we have our industrial district built. We'll have another population in the meantime right before we get that three months before so we will get another worker uh, working as a clerk and we might actually leave the clerks and since we have such a surplus of energy credits and food we could shift one farmer and one technician up to the metallurgist and ardent artisan jobs that pop up we don't want to dip into our mining we need the mineral production 
Matter of fact, we could probably go ahead and do that now, just so we're not having the low amenities. We'll be getting decent food. We could shift a farmer over. That drops it by eight. We'll still have plus seven surplus. And now we actually have positive amenities, which is a slight happiness boost instead of a penalty. I should have done that a while ago. But it'll be 10 months before we need to start working on the hollow theaters. And we are going to be building mining stations in the meantime. Each one will take about three to four months. So we're going to be down 200 more minerals. So we do need to keep buying minerals right now. Now, while I would like to also buy alloys, I do need to start keeping a minimum energy credit banked. As a matter of fact, it'd be nice if I could uh, eventually get up to having a thousand or more energy credits because some anomalies you run into will need an investiture of energy credits. There's one anomaly that I think costs 2,000 and you can run into it pretty early in the game. So it is something to be wary of. Of basically spending all your resources too early. But you also want to develop. So there is that. Now it'll probably take me about six months to get over here. Actually longer than that since I'll be building energy uh, things along the way. So I will go ahead and queue up moving there. I'll probably have that system claimed and be able to go ahead and claim both of these. Yeah, might consider expanding to those two eventually. Because this, I could probably keep going this way to get a de another decent choke point. Traveler found one aquatic species native to Ethelium 5 that has not only achieved a tentative mastery of the planet's vast oceans, but also the small plots of land that dot its surface. Scientist Cassandra Popovic proposes that we should monitor their development closely and possibly help them along the path to full sapience. No. Something to keep in mind for the future. No, we're not going to help them along to full sapience. That was the ocean world. Uh, good size, crappy resources. We get a little bit of energy on it, but it's primarily going to be an industrial area. Let's have a look at these idiots. Numerians. Starborn. They get a bonus to growth from immigration, resettlement cost, and habitability. That's actually not a bad species. The habitability bonus means I could shift them to my other worlds as workers. Now, since I have migration controls on for them, I'll only get the bonus to immigration when I have them growing on a world that has immigration. But the resettlement reduction is nice. This actually wouldn't be a bad species to eventually uplift as, say, indentured servants or something. Maybe we'll consider it. For now, they can remain pre-sapients for a while. Construction complete. We have our second shipyard done. So while we are building colony ships, we could start queuing up reinforcements. And we'll do that. We'll start reinforcing this fleet. We need to get it up. We also need to buy another hundred minerals. We're about seven months away from needing another construction going here. So by October, we need to go ahead and start queuing this up to be a hollow theater. So we're going to need 400 uh, minerals by then. We're about eight months away from our first tradition. Another pre-sapient species. Scurrying through the sands on Ethelium 5a, a curious form of mammalian life, exhibits many of the traits associated with the evolution of higher reasoning. While the species development appears to have been plateaued some millennia ago, we might be able to provide a technological impetus for evolution. This is actually a good generator world.
They are also starborn. This species is always consciously or not long to traverse the void between the stars. Boy, we're getting some nice slave material, aren't we? Anomaly found. Toxic terraforming candidate discovered. Our detailed survey of Elithium-3 has revealed that although it is currently unsuitable for life due to the noxious gases present in its atmosphere, it is capable of sustaining a breathable atmosphere. Through a concerted effort, we may be able to break the planet's toxins down into a less lethal compounds. Terraforming this planet would theoretically be possible, but we do not yet possess the means to accomplish this monumental task within a realistic time frame. So I need the detox ascension perk to do that. Now about that, if we go check ascension perks and scroll down, I believe toxic is all the way at the bottom, detox. We need climate restoration for it, but one great thing about this, it tells you how many of those worlds are within your border. So you can decide when you get an ascension perk if it is worth investing in, which is absolutely great for an ascension perk that requires you to have those worlds to be able to know, yeah, when I'm going to choose ascension perks, I can see whether or not this has value to me. I really like that feature. Oh, and I forgot this anomaly we discovered. A feel for steel, the mineral composition of Ethelium-3 does not match projections. Now, it's only a level above me. It'll only add 60 days to it. We're going to go ahead and research that rather than move it, because it'll take me more than 60 days to move out and back in. It takes about three months, I mean about a month, to uh, leave a system at least when you don't have any speed upgrades. So it's going to be six months before I finish surveys here. How many more has he got? Quite a few, actually. So it'll be a while before I start expanding this way, but I still need to grab Tybor and Hanteron before I start progressing this way. And I can actually make use of this ocean world and likely this tropical world. I do have 70% habitability on an ocean world. It's not too bad, but it does boost your upkeep and reduce your resources. So it's not ideal. I'm going to go for the continental worlds and get them developed first, but just a few habitability upgrades tech-wise or some other features, and these make great worlds. I prefer to stick to 80% or higher. Now we still got three months before I have to queue up the hollow theaters here. We've only got 200 more we're going to drop and in three months we will get another 1,220. I will go ahead and buy 100 more minerals just to make sure I have it when I need it. Our colony ship is now on route. It's going to take four months to get over there and then probably about three to four years to develop into a colony I can do something with. All right, so we've got one more month left on this industrial district. We'll immediately get started on replacing the commercial zones with a hollow theater. That will take care of our amenity issues. We won't have the clerks struggling to do that. It will drop our energy credits a bit because clerks do provide trade value, which is energy credits. So I'll lose about eight energy credits doing this, but I will gain a lot more because the boost in amenities will give a little bit of resources from jobs. So I think that's worth it. And I think I'm gonna buy some more alloys. Actually, no. Can I build a ship without buying alloys? I can indeed. So we're not going to spend money this time. I want to kind of let my energy credits get up to about 2,000 just in case. But we'll go ahead and add another ship. We want to get our naval capacity up a little bit higher. We're going to have to improve our naval capacity. So we are going to need soldier jobs eventually. All right, we now have a decent surplus of consumer goods. We will be using up some of those on these hollow theaters. That's two on it, another 
research lab will take another four. That'll get us back down to three, so we're going to need more consumer goods eventually, which means we're going to need another mining district to support another industrial district. But that is going to have to wait until... All right. First, let's move a farmer over to be a clerk. Actually, let's keep that job closed. Let's move one technician over to be a clerk. And that gets us back positive for now. And when these hollow theaters get built, they can move clerks up there, and then we won't have to worry about micromanaging clerks so much. We will still be able to keep a positive amenities. But what I was saying, building the additional mining and industrial districts can kind of slow down to the point uh, where we have to worry about giving people jobs after we get these jobs we really need built because we don't want to be dragging our miners, farmers, and technicians up to other jobs when we need to be building up our resources after we get the initial ones that are going to be helping us out. So once we get these hollow theaters and get a nice boost, I could probably, that'll bring two of these and leave three people down here who are working clerk jobs. Well, if I fill up these two, I can wait until I would have one additional job, or I could actually spare a farmer again. I can go into a research lab next. After that, it'll be a while before I add additional mining district, additional industrial district, and another building. And that additional building will probably be another administrative office, just so I can push through traditions a little faster. Speaking of traditions... Since we haven't really encountered too awfully much, I did encounter a pre-FTL I can invade, but I don't really need domination to deal with them. Because it'll be a while before I'm actually making use of Slave Pops. We've only found one to invade. I think I am going to go with expansion, so my colonies develop faster. And I should, before the first colony is built, be able to get colonization fever and have that first colony start with two pops instead of one. We must expand our civilization to new systems and planets or risk eventual extinction. So this is giving me a bonus to colony development speed. Now, as far as the ones I like to do with Commonwealth of Man, like I said, the way the game develops kind of affects it, but I usually do like expansion, domination, and supremacy. I'm also fond of unyielding and subterfuge. That still leaves me two wild cards. So if I get one that pushes me toward a particular ascension perk, now that they are traditions, I can go that route. If I don't, uh, a lot of times I will end up going politics because I am trying to take, uh, take over the galactic community and I do want to play around with this one. Adaptability is also a decent one for getting more out of a colony. And I can really make use of the resettlement cost reduction, unlike when I was United Nations of Earth. I can manually resettle pops. So adaptability, expansion, domination, supremacy, unyielding, and subterfuge are usually my go-tos with one more wild card. Um... Politics is a new one that I haven't gotten, and, and these Ascension perks are new ones. A lot of times it depended on what happened in the game. Sometimes I did go Diplomacy just for the additional diplomatic power, but now that they have Politics, I would probably replace that because I don't really care about building up embassies and growing up trust and crap like that. Diplomacy is not something I do to maintain allies as Commonwealth of Man. It's a temporary measure to keep people at bay until I am ready to conquer them. But we are going to go expansion. And it'll take three years before we get our next one. And we should get it before this colony is fully developed. Especially if we get something that gives us a bu boost of unity. Right now, it's going to be a while before we get planetary unification, 
but in the interim, I am going to have another research lab, and I can be finding anomalies that could give me unity. Teachings of Warriors Across the barren fields of Ethelium III, there are indications of old battles being fought. Beneath the lifeless grounds, our researchers on the CNS Traveler have found bones, metallic shards, and most surprisingly, a container filled with documents. If we send these documents to our homeworld for translation, we could potentially learn more about this war and who fought in it. It would also be possible to simply sell them off as antiques. So we get a chunk of energy credits if we sold them as antiques, or we could send them to our homeworld for research. Now, as humans, even though we are kind of xenophobic, militaristic, I still play them a little bit like I do United Nations of Earth. We are still curious. We are still scientifically motivated and we are still explorers. So we are going to send this to our home world for research. Even if we had, we kind of disdain or don't trust Xenos, that does not mean we cannot study them to be able to better deal with them. New sit rep. Now it would take four years to study these warrior texts. That's four years it will delay our planetary unification. And of course, it'll go by faster when we get some stored research from something. Four years, though, before we get a lump sum of unity. And this is going to give us an edict, I believe. But these are warriors' texts. This is something that would be of interest to us. Technically, we're already unified. We are a, dicta uh, a dictatorship. So yes, we are going to research this. We are curious about that. Our pioneers have made planet fall. Our colony ship has gently touched down at the mouth of a large river delta on one of several continents that can be found on Flaxington. The temperate forested region will serve as an ideal first landing site. The ship has been permanently converted into the administrative headquarters of the new settlement, and its reactor core is in the process of being removed so that it may serve as the colony's temporary power source. Hundreds of small tents and prefab shelters have sprung up around the former starship's massive hull as colonists begin to disembark in large numbers. The first human city on an alien world. Uh, really? Isn't Unity an alien world? Aren't we from Earth? Some of the text from some of the things that pop up aren't as fitting, I think, for a lost colony start. And that would also go with some of the other starts. Like when you first encounter alien life, it's kind of weird if you had common ground and were already in a federation with two other species and things like that. So unfortunately, some of the flavor text doesn't really take into account your origin. There's a lot of these that talk about first finding a world that is habitable by humans when we are on a world that is not our home world. Now that'll give us a little bit of stored engineering research. 300 is not nearly enough. That would keep us going for about 12 months. Yeah, about 12. It'll knock. Uh, basically, it ends up knocking about 12 months off of this because we'll be running at double speed for 12 months. So for the next 12 months, we're actually getting the effect of 24 months, and then it'll go back to being doubled again. Now, if we look at Flaxington, it's going to be two years before it is done. So it will probably be developed 
close to see at this rate it now that you, with the mouse over it tells you about when you'll get it we'll get this in 2205 September of 2205 this colony will be done in December of 2204 so it's going to be about nine months behind being able to give us an extra population right off the bat there unless we get something that boosts unity in the interim one thing I might consider well once we get the hollow theaters built which will be in about 10 more months that will give us two extra unity a month which is a 10% increase so we're going to be going 10 months that'll leave us down to 23 it'll it'll be dropped down to about 21 so we'll be shaving two months off of this not quite enough off of that alone we are going to need a boost to unity from some other source there's no telling where we might get it or instead of building another research lab I might consider going ahead and building another admin office that would be a 50% increase to our unity of course that will take another year as well let's see that'll be done in 10 months another one of these would take a year so a year and 10 months would be two months before this is completed recon pass completed we got Tybor completed we can go ahead and queue up oh we we need to wait one more month before we can queue up building the star base it'll be a while before he's headed that way anyway Tybor doesn't really have anything that's going to slow me down from going straight to Hanteron that all depends on my alloys at that point so I may just claim this system, claim this one, and then go back and do the mining stations while I wait. Our governor gained the resilient trait, so he has a bonus to his leader lifespan. He gained that through hard work. He ended up living longer. Go figure. Yeah, the governor leveled up a, probably about a month or two earlier than the scientists do. Detected the presence of a barbarian alien civilization on Elithium II. They have advanced in the equivalent of the Iron Age and are divided into numerous petty kingdoms and empires. Their species has spread across the almost the entire surface of the planet. So if we go take a look at them, this is a world we might be able to inhabit. Yes, yeah, 70%. We could handle that. That will be an additional colony we can develop with a small amount of population we can control and what are these guys like they are xenophobes well that fits in with us they're unruly communal unruly communal people people who like to live together and brawl uh, they are talented. That's useless to us. Extra leader, leader level cap. We're not going to have leaders of them. Uh, governing ethics attraction. They're conformist. That's not that special either. They'll still make good slaves. Now that is uh, one thing I forgot to mention. Is These guys will have 100% habitability on this world because it's their home world. That is one thing you miss out on with Lost Colony. We have continental preference, adaptive, and colonial spirit. Without adaptive, we would only have a 90% habitability on this world because this is not our home world. Earth is our home world. So, being humans, we still have 100% habitability on unity. Unless you take adaptive as a trait, you will only have 90% habitability on your capital as a lost colony. I need to start saving up my alloys for another colony ship. I'm about to get access to a continental world. 
I probably should have been saving it up before, but I do need to, to slowly build up my fleets. Now this system didn't have a habitable world in it. We're almost to the last area we need for finding the hyacinth. And that, I believe, might give us a chunk of unity, completing the hyacinth uh, storyline. Oddly enough, we have not found a precursor anomaly. Okay, so these two directions link up. System reconnaissance completed. We finished uh, Ethelium. We are now moving to Caspadine. And once we get it, after we go back and claim Hanterun, we can start claiming this way to get a couple of planets to invade for extra colonies. Beta Ursa Majoris. Nothing habitable in this system. We've got to survey the whole system before we complete the situation. All right, we're about a month away from the Hollow Theaters. We can start on our next thing. The Hollow Theaters can pull up two clerks to be entertainers. That'll still leave us three people working clerk jobs. Yeah, we can go ahead and, and build something else. And I think I do want an administrative office. Let's see. We still have about a year. Well, we'll only get that for two months. That won't... A 50% increase. I don't think... I don't think it's going to drop it enough. Yeah, I don't think it's going to drop it enough, so we will go for the research labs next. Construction complete. All right, so we got this. We're on our way to Hanteran. We have the resources to go ahead and say build the star-based outpost. And then we can start building our mining stations on the way back. Now, one thing, I did not explore this system, but now that I built this star base, if I advance it a day, I'll be able to see what's there. A whole bunch of nothing. Um... There's a good chance this is a pretty good resource heavy zone or has some decent resources in it. But that's something right now I'm more interested in grabbing a couple of choke points and a couple of colonies and then I will come back and start checking these other systems to see if any are worth developing. Now with any luck that dead ends. It might connect to there, but hopefully that doesn't reconnect so that we'll have another decent choke point somewhere around here. Actually, that looks like it's in their space, so this will make another decent choke point, or possibly this system. Oh, and we did get, and yes, it did pull up the clerks to be one entertainer. Oh, come on. I want two entertainers. I should have checked that. Uh, a month ago. That gives us a decent output. And yes, that knocked two months off of it. It would take a year and that would leave us five months left if we built the, if we had started building the um, bureaucrat's office. Five months left. At the time we got it down to five months left, we could have knocked three months off of it. that still would have had it. It might have completed at the same time. Or maybe one month before. Because let's see, if we, if we had run for 12 months, there'd be seven months left on this. Increasing our output by 50% would have knocked maybe two and a half months off of it. No, we, we still would have not completed it in time. So we do need a unity burst from something else. We're about five to six months away from being able to queue up another colony ship. And I think after I get this system, I'm going to push on to this one. I want him, after he finishes this system, to explore over this way. 
as you can see now that that stored research has run out it's jumped back up construction complete all right so we are going to go ahead and start grabbing things along here we've got the minerals start with the research station grab that mining station then that mining station and I I'm queuing up inter orbit first to start sending them the next way so if I ever run myself into a deficit it doesn't cancel all of their orders because they're all just build mining station it will immediately go to moving to the next one and just abandon the first one so I can correct the issue and immediately control shift and tell him go back and build that mining station I bought the resources you need but that way I can queue up a lot of these just by telling them to enter orbit first and then build the research station now once you have a decent income you generally don't have to worry about it after that and then we will move there and get ready to start expanding this way by then I should have churned out some soldiers I probably only need about two maybe three armies two armies would probably do let's check oh I can no longer look at it because I don't have a science ship in the vicinity they're just a tech above these guys and I know these guys I could do with one army I think two armies should be sufficient to take them out but I can wait until I'm getting ready to claim the area to worry about it or at least when I'm on my way to build this star base I can start turning out the armies and start sending them that way now I don't think I'm gonna finish all of these surveys since I have so many in time to get the unity boost if I do get a unity boost and not like a sociology tech out of this so yeah we've only got about seven more months I think it's gonna take me longer than a month for each of these we've got five left and there is travel time between them yeah it's like a week or two to get over there and I get about I think three percent a tick so that's gonna end up being about 30 days each yeah I'd need four more months it, it'll be close I might get it in time if it gives me any unity it'd be great well some of these are more travel time so that may be bad I can go ahead and queue up another colonizing and actually I keep forgetting I could have done that earlier I'm so not used to having okay this will be dawn light I am so not used to having a reduction in or the uh, fleet expansion agenda which reduces the sheet uh, the ship build cost that kept throwing me off I could have had that a few months earlier but oh well and now I can start investing in building up this fleet a little more of course my empire size has grown I now need 30 fleet to be able to come close we have discovered a new archaeological site in Beta Ursus Major anyone home We'll worry about that when we get that system in our empire. Two months left there. We've still got two more things to survey. Oh, they're both, they're all really close. We might get it just in time. And we're ready to queue something else up if we need to. Let's actually move a farmer over to be a clerk because the clerks boosting our amenities just a little bit more just gives us just a tad more unity yeah we still need 176 and we're not going to get it in two months unless we get this research done 
our scientists who are leading tech have leveled up. Nope, I don't think we're getting it. It'll be right after. During its survey of Beta Ursa Majoris IV, the CNS emissary discovered several exotic gases previously unknown to us. These gases have a variety of different uses, particularly in the operation of advanced energy-based weapons and force fields. Some of the gases can also be used as starship fuel or even as recreational drugs. We do not yet possess the means to extract this resource. We should seriously consider establishing control over the system for future exploitation. <laughs> Of every intention of exploiting this area. So we are on our way to the last one. It's going to take us eight days to get over there. That would leave us ten days to complete it. Not mm -hmm. going to happen. We'd be 30% done by the time our colony is developed. So our first colony will not get the benefit of plus one population. But now as you see my tech costs have dropped drastically because I have a second research lab. So we will have quantum theory in five years. So it would have taken a grand total of nine years instead of, I believe it was 15 originally. And six more years to have our engineering research, which would have taken 17 years, I think. So yeah, uh, we'll have our first few techs by about the 10 year mark. That's not too bad. We have claimed a new world. So Flaxington is up and running. It only has one pop working a colonist job. Now there's not really much reason for me to worry about boosting uh, the available jobs in huge excess over what my planet can do apart from if I don't want them working useless jobs so since the next person is probably going to be a colonist now that colonist actually I will go ahead and let it be a colonist I will worry about uh, one thing I can do is add more jobs and start shifting jobs over from here that I don't need so I could start moving all my mineral production over here and replacing my mining districts with something like industrial districts or agriculture or generator. But I could shift those and shifting these allows me to do more specialized operations without boosting my empire size because I'm not adding a new district. I'm just shifting a district from one area to another. Which is something, if you want to keep your empire size low, is a good thing to do early in the game. So I do kind of, I am going to be building districts over here, so that is going to be boosting empire size. But right now we will keep this a colony, and again, I can also, if I have, when population grows over here, shift it over here and start worrying about the jobs then. Right now I'm just going to let it go. Uh, in about two months, I'll have an extra farmer. I could shift that over there because I don't need that much surplus food. Or I could shift this farmer over to be a clerk over here just for a little bit more happiness. Yeah, I don't have the minerals to start building a district. I could start building a building first, which is usually a better idea. Buildings don't add to empire size. More unity would be nice from the Autocathon monument. But after this hits population 5, it's going to need another source of amenities. So the first building over here would probably be a hollow theater anyway, although I will need more consumer goods to support it. So I don't think I have much of a rush on a building here right now. Now one thing to mention is the culture workers here because I have different factions. They boost my naval capacity for the militarist and my citizen pop happiness for the xenophobes. Now citizen pop happiness means only boost the happiness of species that have full citizenship. 
so it will not boost the happiness of my slaves. It will only boost the happiness of my humans right now, because those are the only ones that will be full citizens. But these do help you boost your happiness, which in turn boost your stability, which are very useful if you're struggling with factions that are hard to please. And I have enough alloys, I think I will add another ship. Anomaly found. Inconsistent readings. The measured surface temperature of Caspadine 5 is in the hundreds of degrees, despite its frozen surface. What could be causing these discrepancies? Well, that one is only going to take me a little over three months. And speaking a little over three months, I think we will complete this Recon pass completed. before the end of the episode. System surveyed. The CNS emissary has managed to isolate a residual ion trail in the Beta Ursa Majoris system that is identical to the one that was produced by the Chrysanthemum's engines. It must have originated from the Hyacinth. Although the faint ion trail is over a century old, Science Officer Azizi Nikwali has managed to track it on an outbound trajectory towards a previously uncharted star. We have entered its coordinates into the situation log. The scientist must, uh, the hyacinth must be there. So we will add that to our situation log. Okay, so we have to push on further to find it. Now I am going to go ahead and explore this way with him. There's no rush on completing that at this point. But it has been five years. So we'll call this an episode. Thank you all for watching. And we'll see you next time.